I talked to Jacob about this and, and I'm, I'm really grateful that you permitted, uh, or you, you've permitted me to indulge myself with this question, which is current federal reserve policy has me frightened because how much more money can you print before it just stops working? Right. There has to be a number. And so I looked for historical examples and you being a professor of history, I had to ask this question too, which is I came on the topic of the debasement of Roman coinage back in the, uh, it was around the first century. I think it was, you're the, you're the professor. So I'll lean on your expertise. And for those listening, what the Romans did effectively is originally their coins were made of precious metal. I think it was silver, Liam. Is that right? Or was it gold? Or I can't remember. Mostly silver. You're using. Mostly silver. And they started diluting the content of silver in their coins. So first it was just, you know, 95% silver, then 80. And they gradually just reduced it. That was the closest historical parallel I could think of to our current monetary policy. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on that at all. Yeah, rather a lot. And once I want to try and avoid getting too much into the weeds because yeah, I'm, I'm a historian of ideas. Yeah. But I still do have at least some regional foci. Uh, and I'm basically a historian um, of uh, the Middle East and Europe, which means essentially the Mediterranean basin. Mm -hmm. And I do teach, teach the ancient Mediterranean. Um, but rather than getting too much into that, what I want to try and do is separate the two as examples because it's, I, I get why it seems like tempting as a yes. parallel. Yes. But they honestly have nothing to do with one another. Bummer. I mean, it's it's sort of like I don't know, spaceships and whales. Like all right, ooh, like um, the uh, the key here is how the currency is conceived and how it works. And one of the things that people often don't understand about uh, the fiat currency relative to one that's like grounded in something physical. Mm -hmm. I mean, first off, there's the fact that even physical money is still Yes. It's still an idea. <laughs> yeah. What makes this particular metal worthwhile? It's not like a lot of them were particularly rare anyway. They were just prettier, you know? I mean, it, it, and that, some of that just evolved out of, I mean, you can go all the way back to um, the, the Mesopotamian cultures. And they, I mean, you know, things like um, shekels and minas and whatnot were not a coin. They were literally weights. Mm -hmm. So we, you'd have a bar of, of metal, right? Or a big old lump of something, like, wham, like this big old chunk of something. Uh, and they're like, well, gosh, that's hard to carry around. You were doing it because the metal itself is is practical. It's useful in that sense, right? You could melt it down and turn it into something. So you see why they, they yeah, that it, it evolved out of a barter system. And they, they you started using chunks of metal because they were at least more compact than bringing a herd of goats with me. Sure, sure. What people hit upon, and this is a shift in the um, uh, the seventh century BC with the uh, the Lydians, was like, why don't we just use much smaller things and use gold? because it's relatively rare and you don't end up wanting to melt it down mm -hmm. and reuse it because it doesn't have any other practical purpose where like iron is useful. You don't want to make a weapon out of gold. Yeah. Right? So they shifted to that, but people had to buy into the idea that somehow that color of metal was worthwhile. And that as an idea, like it worked for a while, but ultimately it's as much of a spook as fiat currencies are because it yeah. still involves us making the decision that this shiny metal means something and isn't mm -hmm. just a shiny piece of metal like a, a rock, you know? Yeah. Uh, the, what fiat currency allows you to do is to break um, the... Well, it, it affects like the, the debt levels. Just think about um, if you know anything about American history in like the later 19th century with the populist movement and the, the move for like the... Um, that the silver standard instead of a gold standard. Yeah. It was because silver isn't worth as much as gold. And what that would do is all the debt that, that farmers and working people had accumulated would not hurt them as much. The mm -hmm. gold standard only benefits the filthy rich. The more money is worth, the more you have that deflation, the only people who benefit are the filthy rich. Everyone else is actually harmed by it. Mm -hmm. and it makes the debt burdens that any woman have from whether student debt, consumer debt, housing debt, it would make it hurt a lot more. Mm -hmm. What sets the value of fiat currencies though, isn't as much just the pure idea. You do need the idea because you have, in one sense, because you have to trust that this government is a thing like, you know, that, that it's not going to disappear tomorrow. Yeah. But, but 
obviously, let's set, let's set that one aside because, yeah, pretty clear big countries are pretty stable at this point. The thing that most matters about them is the relative rate of economic growth. A higher inflation level is actually beneficial to the economy. And actually, international banks suggest that we should have at least a 2% inflation rate because, again, it helps with the debt that businesses take on. Mm -hmm. It helps to make the, the debt just from growing your business less costly by doing that. What makes it so that it's never really going to come back around and bite us in the butt. And honestly, like our fantasies about the, the federal debt, it's basically misapplying something. It's assuming that like the federal government's budget is anything like your household budget. And it's not. They have yeah. nothing in common. Yeah, we did. We I actually had a guest back in January talk about modern monetary theory and the whole idea that, yeah, that effectively uh, the the goal of government debt or the the and 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 the relationship to inflation is that ideally the government should be taking on a certain amount of debt. Uh, and unlike uh, your household budget, that economy is going to continue to grow in perpetuity as long as you're making the right investments. Effectively. Uh, see, and, and, and again, it varies there. So there are times when the government should take on debt and times when it shouldn't. Mm -hmm. And those are all based upon the relative growth rates. Mm -hmm. So if you, and if you do the wrong thing, you know, if you, if you apply to the wrong point, like, we, uh, we misapplied the austerity in the 1990s under Clinton and ended up causing a significant economic crisis a few years down the line because of that, mm -hmm. uh, because it really depends upon the growth rates in the real economy. And that, again, gets back to the money in our hands. Yes. The worker pay still wasn't going up, but the federal pay went down. The federal uh -huh. spending went down. That means it's injecting less liquidity into the economy. and It's not making up for the fact that we don't have much money. Yeah. So yep. It crushes the whole thing. So the key always is, is it's basically thinking holistically about it. Mm -hmm. you know, it and what, what federal policy should be doing and the value of these kind of um, currency structures and economic structures is that you're, you're supposed to think of the economy holistically. Mm -hmm. you know, how is it growing? And a, a good part of the, the problem is that we have gotten so used to abandoning the, the whole real economy. We think in terms of the stock market and job growth numbers, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And realistically speaking, what what value there is on the NASDAQ is irrelevant to mm -hmm. you know, 85% of Americans. It just does not matter in any way, shape, or form. And it doesn't matter how many jobs you create if they're shitty dead-end jobs. If they're Popeyes, for example. Yeah, exactly. If they're yeah. just you know a minimum wage job working at Popeyes does not actually help the economy. It literally is a negative to the economy. So the high job growth numbers we saw under Bill Clinton – we're actually literally harmful because we're not thinking in terms of the amount of money the ordinary worker or middle class person has to spend. That circulation of cash is the economy, not what's floating around on the stock market. Yeah. And so with Federal Reserve policy, you could say all roads lead to Rome. Sorry, Liam, I could not resist that stupid joke. So um... <laughs> yeah. the, the trick with the, the Roman example there is that mm -hmm. People had sucked in the idea yeah. that, the, that the type of metal was yeah. important itself. And they weren't thinking of it in terms of like the strength or stability of the state. And the government itself was not really used to injecting capital into the economy. It, that's not what the Roman state ever did. The Roman yeah. state extracted wealth from ordinary people to, to support its armies. It didn't actually build schools and hospitals. Yes. It, it didn't care about the economic development out in the provinces, which is why the vast majority of the empire was agrarian rural subsistence farmers. Yep. Yep. Okay. So, you know, and and the, the, the key there is if you start thinking of economics that way, that's the direction you're headed is a subsistence economy. When we had like no federal reserve, mm -hmm. and we go back to, to, to the earlier policies and we go back more to the gold standard. We had a 70% poverty rate in this country. Most people were, and, rural and poor and and i think the parallel uh as well is if you look at rome like you said people focus so much on the coinage didn't really focus on the stability of the state uh likewise we're in a situation where the gdp numbers like you said the stock market numbers the employment numbers aren't necessarily reflective of what we really are going for what we really want yeah, and the state like the existence of this government it's it's solid it's secure it's not going anywhere yeah. we have tons of social and political and economic problems but we're not in danger of complete collapse. Yeah. Right? I mean, people's talk even of like civil war stuff is so massively overblown that it's almost farcical. 
Yeah. We're not, this state is going nowhere. The Roman state honestly always struggled. It never had much development overall, mm -hmm. and it didn't have um, much to fall back on other than the army. What ultimately undermined the Roman state was the declining skills of the military and its mm -hmm. inability to deal with like larger circumstances, like the large scale migrations uh, to, to their north that had nothing to do with them at all. Mm -hmm. But all of their, they were used to extracting wealth from people and spending it on soldiers. And that's literally all they did. Mm -hmm. And what happened in the later empire, you start getting into like the second and third century through these debasement is a lot of rich people did something that we are seeing now. And there, so there is an interesting parallel um, where today we're looking at people socking tons of cash in the stock market. That's not relevant to us or socking money in the Cayman islands and a tax shelter or something. Um, tons of wealthy Romans moved out to the countryside to a remote villa and stop paying their taxes. They stopped contributing in any way. Mm. Honestly, the whole rise of like the feudal peasant class has yeah. to do with ordinary people be being feeling squeezed in the cities because when they lost more rich people, when rich, you had this, it's similar to the whole like white flight phenomenon in LA had. Yeah, you know? for sure. You know, rich people left the city of Rome and moved out to the countryside. So what did the state have to do to pay for those soldiers? It started taxing ordinary people. Yeah. So taxes on working Romans went up. So a lot of those Romans fled to the countryside and willingly signed up as near slaves to, to, for protection from the government. So these villa owners had their own little private armies to protect them from the, the Roman state. And as it lost more money, it didn't have the soldiers. And eventually, like, it takes a few centuries, but you have the rise of, like, the feudal dynamic instead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you remove money from the economy in the way a lot of these, like, trickle-down theorists are doing, you're essentially... It's a neo-feudal ideology. You're essentially yeah. saying, I don't care about the stability of the whole, whether it's the state or the economy. All I care about is protecting what I have. And what you're going to do is destroy the entire economy on which we all depend. That's what the Romans did. I am so glad I asked that question. I'm so <laughs> glad I asked that question.